Good morning. I'm Randy Sadler with CIC Services. It's wonderful to have you all join today. Our webinar is titled Common Objections to Owning a Captive Insurance Company that Stop Middle Market Business Owners from Acting in the Best Interest of Their Companies. This is probably the longest webinar, webinar title you will ever find. Uh, if you find a longer one, please let me know. But I uh, couldn't figure out a way to say it shorter unless we said something like just making bad decisions or something simple like that. Uh, our presentation today is going to be an interview between me, uh, Randy Sadler, a principal here at CSE Services, and our in-house counsel and founder, Sean King. Sean, Sean is an attorney, CPA. Uh, many of you uh, know him in the industry. He's often published in Captive Insurance Times, Captive Review, uh, and many other publications. And just so we can get a sound check before we get started, Sean, if you could quickly introduce yourself, that would be great. Hey, Randy. Yep, this is Sean. I hope everybody can hear me okay. If not, just let me know. But looking forward to uh, to the dialogue today. Excellent. Yeah, Sean, you sound great. So I uh, do want to remind everybody, keep your computer or phone on mute unless you're asking a question. You can actually ask your questions by chat. Many of you, now that we've had COVID a while, are probably familiar with Zoom. It does have a chat feature, and uh, normally I'll be able to see your question pop up. All right, this is the CIC Services team. We are here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Sean's in Puerto Rico. Uh, Bill Rogers is in, the, is in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, but really the rest of our team is right here in Knoxville, and we'd be honored to work with you or serve you any way we can. Uh, Sean, I'll let you tell them a little bit about yourself, and then I'll tell them a little bit about me. Sure. Well, I'm, um, I'm Sean. I'm an attorney and CPA. I grew up around the uh, financial services industry. My father was in the insurance industry for his entire career, and um, I, I was basically born into the insurance industry in one form or fashion. Um, but I, I have always been drawn to sectors of the insurance and financial services industry, really where law, accounting, insurance, and investments all kind of come together. And the two main expressions of that have been uh, qualified retirement plan work, where we have a third party administration firm that helps administer uh, retirement plans across the country, and um, also captive insurance work. Um, and both of those are areas where law, accounting, insurance, and investments all, all come together in, in one neat little opportunity. Outstanding. Yeah, so Sean is, Sean is a powerhouse in the industry, as many of you know, uh, regularly published, uh, and has just been, a, he really is the visionary and strategic leader for our firm. So uh, it's great to have him on the line today. A little bit about my background. I'm Randy Sadler. I'm also a principal here at CIC Services. I grew up in Knoxville, Tennessee as well. A lovely place to be. Uh, I went to the United States Military Academy at West Point uh, and was a tank commander for five years. And I tell everyone that's really where I learned risk management with uh, soldiers, equipment, ammunition, fuel, and having to make sure everybody was safe. Safety was number one priority and we spent lots of time on it. Uh, so that's really where I got my uh, you know, Got my start in risk management. I've uh, worked in a few Fortune uh, 50s and a few other companies, but I've been at CIC Services eight years. And uh, we've, in the time I've been here, we've seen a tremendous growth as a firm helping businesses own their own insurance company. So a little bit about CIC Services before we get too much into the meat of what we're gonna talk about today. We are a captive manager, which really in simple terms means that we help businesses self-insure or own their own insurance company would be another way of thinking about it and helping them insure their business from a wide range of risks, asset protect, uh, accumulate profits and wealth. Uh, and very often for a middle, middle market company, and that's really primarily where we focus is middle market businesses, uh, that captive insurance company becomes a powerful financial vehicle for the business and for the owners uh, and can even support and really long-term goals that they may have. Now you can see that we've been a, a finalist uh, for the U.S. Captive Awards. Uh, we are an ICCIE trained organization. Uh, and so we're uh, very excited about the, the future of the industry and also of our firm. So um, a little bit more about us. We help businesses own their own insurance company. And I'll let Sean tell you, you know, some of the benefits of owning your own insurance company. So this is, I think, 
in the past, it may have been a little more difficult to, uh, to convey the importance and the benefits of potentially owning one's insurance company. I think to a very large degree, that's probably changed over the last six months or so, eight months or so with the outbreak of SARS-CoV-2 and uh, the, the impact that that has had on our economy and on a great, great many small and mid-market businesses um, across the country. And um, so I'll just hit the highlights here without going into too much depth. But basically, captives can be used to establish asset-protected loss reserves. You know, businesses do have contingencies, things like SARS, things like wildfires, things like uh, cyber attacks, uh, innumerable different risks can happen. And most businesses have to uh, reserve for those risks, if they're smart, simply by retaining earnings in the business or by accumulating wealth in the business owner's name that can later be used to help plug some of those losses. The problem with that is that wealth is very rarely asset protected. Uh, if the business gets sued, all of those reserves can be lost. If the business owner gets sued and that wealth was in the business owner's name, all that those reserves can be lost. When we pay premiums to a real insurance company to insure our business against various risks, that insurance company is going to be uh, building the reserves. And it's going to be a bankruptcy remote and a uh, creditor remote entity. It's going to be very difficult for creditors of the business or the business owner who are not insured of the captive insurance company itself uh, to get to those, those, those loss reserves. Secondly, uh, we can increase the profits and wealth, oftentimes by millions of dollars, by using a captive insurance company to uh, accumulate those reserves more tax efficiently, potentially, and uh, also by replacing third-party commercial insurance, which is a sunk cost, with potentially captive insurance, where if we manage our losses properly and well, manage our risk well, we can turn that sunk cost into really a sunk profit. Thirdly is lowering the in insurance costs. Again, we can potentially replace expensive third-party commercial insurance, which has to build in uh, at, into the premium enough money to cover their big corporate offices, their commissions they're paying their salespeople, all the marketing and advertising they do. We can strip all of that cost out of an insurance contract when the policy is issued by a captive insurance company, or most of those costs at least. So we can significantly potentially lower our cost of insurance. We can insure uninsured or underinsured risks. This was, after all, the original reasons that captives came into existence was to help businesses insure risks that either could not be insured in the ordinary commercial market or were far too expensive to insure in that market. And then lastly, uh, we can potentially benefit from insurance company tax treatment. As we'll talk about in a few minutes, I think too many people put far too much emphasis on the tax treatment, both for good and for bad, when it comes to captives. Captives can, in some instances, provide extraordinary federal income tax benefits, as well as potentially state and local income tax benefits. But that's not their purpose, and that shouldn't be the basis of the decision. The decision to do a captive should always be done based upon whether or not it's going to solve many of the problems that we just talked about just on this slide right here, as well as other uh, risk management problems of the business. And we can do that, by the way, without claiming benefits that tend to raise the IRS's red flag. Um, so not all captives claim those extraordinary tax benefits. And for a business who is concerned about IRS scrutiny, we can get all of the benefits of a captive insurance company without necessarily claiming the extraordinary tax benefits that, uh, that the IRS um, may, may get concerned about. Uh, or if, the, if we're confident in uh, the business and in the insurance, you can get both the benefits of the captive insurance and potentially some or all of the extraordinary income tax benefits. The key thing to keep in mind is the tax treatment is, is a completely separate decision from the decision about whether or not to do a captive insurance company to protect your business. Very good points, yeah. So Sean's gone through the benefits of a captive. Let's talk a little bit about what a captive is. A captive is a, a real insurance company and I always uh, you know, share with our 
clients or people that are considering a captive, imagine owning your own state farm, if you will. The difference is a captive's license is limited, right? So if you form a captive insurance company and decided to write auto insurance to all your neighbors, it wouldn't be long before you wound up in jail, right? Uh, and that's because your state has a consumer protection interest. They don't want you out uh, chancing it for other people, if you will. However, you can insure your own business or related entities. And the definition of related can stretch a long way. Uh, some businesses use a captive and have their franchisees buy insurance from it, for example. Or business owners mo own multiple businesses that are connected and the captive is able to insure all of them. But a captive is in every way except that limited license, a real insurance company and does everything that a real insurance company does. Uh, the difference is really that it's protecting your business or related entities. Uh, so it's very powerful. Uh, they've been around since the 50s, so they're not new. Uh, in the, for quite a few decades, they were only owned by the, the Fortune 1000 companies, but uh, over time as domiciles or states competed, if you will, to make captives more accessible, they were able to lower the barriers of entry, lower the cost, lower the capital, uh, so that many middle market companies now enjoy protection from their own insurance company. Uh, and what do they do? Well, first of all, they can, they can replace commercial insurance. Uh, and we have a lot of programs that do just that and help businesses that have good loss controls keep more of their money. They can insure enterprise risks. And Sean referenced these earlier as, in many cases, uninsured, underinsured risks uh, where businesses are vulnerable. Uh, they can insure warranties. Now, this is a place to basically create found money. You may have some clients or you may have, have a business that, that uh, is using somebody else's warranty program. You could sell your own. Uh, how powerful would that be? Uh, they can also do bonding, whether it's some contractor default bonds, performance bonds. We've done bonding for construction companies and coal mines. It's a great way to take money that you're throwing away and keep it. So you might have some clients that would benefit from that. Uh, they also are often used in uh, employee benefits, healthcare, and can help lower health insurance costs for a company, sometimes as much as 10 to 15%. That's a big savings. And then you'll notice at the bottom, any combination of the above. So in the middle market, it's particularly powerful for a captive to do more than one of these because then the fixed cost of the insurance company spread over multiple benefits. So uh, don't think about captives as, as having just one function. They're almost like a... Uh, almost like a Swiss army knife, they can do a lot of things. So what are common object, objections to owning a captive insurance company? I realize there's a misprint there, sorry about that. Uh, and this webinar today is gonna feature a discussion between uh, a hesitant business owner that should own a captive, I'll uh, be played by me, uh, Randy Sadler, and then a captive insurance expert played by Sean King uh, from our firm who you've also heard today. So let's dive in. Uh, here's my, Sean, here's my first objection. I mean, you know, I've done a little bit of research. I think captives are really just for large companies. That's the only ones I see about in the paper of the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, well, it's a great point because for decades, really, it was primarily large and, and really very large companies that uh, formed captive insurance companies. And there were a couple of different reasons for this, um, several different reasons, most of which no longer apply. One of the reasons was back in the day, there were only a few captive insurance domiciles, a few states that would license captive insurance companies and a few foreign jurisdictions. And the states that would do it, uh, New York at the time and, and a couple of others, for example, um, had very steep costly requirements. They basically regulated captives, not to the same level as an ordinary commercial company, but but to a very high level and had very large capital requirements and uh, basically made the cost of forming and operating a captive insurance company quite expensive. However, Vermont back in the 90s um, saw an opportunity to become a hub for captive insurance companies like Delaware or Nevada has become a hub for uh, domiciling ordinary corporations. And uh, they passed some very favorable legislation. They got the cost and the administrative burden down. And for the first time, it became possible for smaller companies to begin to take advantage of the many benefits of a captive. And, uh, and they did so. 
And since then, state after state after state has come on. I think there are now 30, I want to say the number is 38 states that will license captive insurance companies. And um, uh, each one, as they have gotten more and more competitive among the states, has really gotten the cost down. We now have uh, captive actuaries that are very active. We now have a, a good stable of captive insurance attorneys across the country who are now competing with each other, whereas before there were primarily just a few specialist attorneys. So the costs have come down considerably and, and the benefits of captive insurance are now really available to business owners in some cases who are looking to pay premiums as little as you know, low six figures. Got it. Okay. Well, that's good to know. So objection uh, number two, I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm a live free or die kind of guy, but even I fear an IRS audit and you know, the IRS hates captives, right, Sean? Well, I guess I got good news and bad news there. Uh, the bad news is yes, the IRS hates captives. Generally, they've really hated captives going back to at least the 1970s. They have, um, pretty aggressively scrutinized over many decades captive insurance companies. That's, that's the bad news. The good news is that up until very recently, um, and I'll come back to this in a second, the IRS lost essentially every single captive insurance tax court case of consequence from the 1970s up until just a few years ago. Uh, they lost the Humana case. They lost the UPS case, they lost the Rent-A-Center case, the Securitas case, the, the RVI case, uh, complete and total victories for taxpayers in each of those cases. And they basically folded up their tent for about five years, starting in the early 2000s, and just kind of said, man, we, you know, <laughs> the tax court just uh, isn't going to let us get our way with these captives. And, uh, but then in the mid 2000s or so, they, um, they, they really begin to renew their focus on certain types of captives, primarily the smaller so-called 831B electing micro captives as they're sometimes called. And the IRS figured out there that small business owners uh, just don't have the, um, the resources, the financial resources, and they don't have the uh, the legal resources in-house to really argue with the IRS, to really go to court if necessary and beat the IRS. And so they figured that they could make uh, more headway by scrutinizing the smaller variety of captives. And, uh, and they did so. So um, as a result of that, they have found, they have won the last three in a row, I think, tax court cases that involve these smaller variety of captives. Those were, in, in every instance, though, I think, challenging cases from the taxpayer's perspective. Each of those cases had some pretty significant warts on it. The first case, for example, um, the taxpayer had loaned out 80% of the captive's assets back to himself. There was no loan documentation initially that documented that loan. He didn't make any timely payments of principal and interest on that loan. Uh, it basically left the captive without the ability to pay any claims should they have come because virtually all of its assets were, were, were gone. They had been loaned out. Um, additionally, uh, there had been no claims. Um, so this was a situation where um, the insurance policies were structured in such a way that uh, claims were, in, in one case, virtually impossible. In one instance, there had never been a circumstance in the known history of the world that would have triggered coverage under one of the policies that was issued. And, uh, and there were some other you know, problematic situations with that structure and the ones after it. So yes, the, the bad news is the IRS scrutinizes these. The bad news is there are opportunities for um, uh, taxpayers to abuse captive insurance arrangements. The good news is two things. Number one, uh, good, valid, legitimate, captive insurance arrangements have been consistently affirmed by the courts. And, um, and for that reason, taxpayers who are making a good faith effort to, to run and operate a legitimate captive insurance company, I think should do so with some confidence. Now they need to be prepared for potential IRS scrutiny if they decide to claim the extraordinary tax benefits that are available 
to 831B electing captives. But they don't need to necessarily. The, the benefits of operating your own insurance company for a small and mid-market business are so extraordinary, even despite the tax consequences, that in many instances, it makes sense to form and operate a captive insurance company, even if you don't claim those extraordinary income tax benef benefits. And if you don't, then you really don't um, hit the IRS's uh, radar target uh, like you would if you were to make the 831B election, which is the election that provides some of those uh, amazing income tax benefits. So I would just always encourage clients to make the decision to do a captive or not based on the insurance needs and the risk management needs of their business. They can make that decision today and then they can decide anytime between now and they file their first captive's tax return, which in many cases is you know, gonna be at least a year and in some cases uh, more than that away, um, whether or not they wanna claim the, the extraordinary tax benefits that are available to, to some captive insurance companies. Those are two separate independent decisions and, and you shouldn't let uh, concerns over IRS uh, scrutiny dissuade you from properly protecting your business from various risks. Oh, and that's good perspective. Uh, also, as I've considered owning a captive, though, you know, I, I really don't want to share a risk with somebody else. I mean, I understand that uh, there's often risk pooling or risk distribution uh, that's required. Um, I mean, I, I don't really feel good about that. H how should I think about it? Yeah, great question. So this is one of the areas where some taxpayers have gotten in trouble, right? Rightfully so with the IRS. In order to have a real insurance arrangement, in fact, inherent in the very definition of insurance is the idea and the ability of the insurance company to spread its risks among multi multiple insureds and or multiple risk exposures. So if a captive insurance company only insures one party for one risk, then um, generally speaking, you're not gonna have real insurance. There is no risk distribution. The insurance company can't use Peter's premium to help pay some of Paul's claim. And we need that both to satisfy uh, IRS concerns if we intend on claiming those amazing tax benefits and uh, also to have real insurance so that if we ever do have a loss, we can get that loss paid in part by unrelated third parties who are uh, insuring uh, indirectly through some sort of risk pooling arrangement, our business. So there are a couple different ways to achieve risk sharing and risk distribution. I'm only gonna talk about one of those today, which is the risk pooling uh, idea. And this is a, a situation where um, a, a large number of captive insurance companies, let's just assume 100 to make the math easy, get together and basically agree to help insure some of each other's risks. And in the arrangement that I'm most familiar with, um, that risk gets shared on a 51%, 49% basis. So for example, let's say you set up your own insurance company and you're insuring various different risks. And, uh, and you have a $100,000 claim. Let's say one of the risks that you insured was a, a business interruption risk. And thanks to, uh, to COVID, um, your business was interrupted. Customers were not able to uh, leave their homes to make it to your business, et cetera. And um, under the particular policy terms of your policy, that loss was covered. Well, in that case, you would file your claim. And let's say it was $100,000 of just to pick a round number. Actually, let's use a million dollars. Let's assume there's a million dollar loss. Well, that loss would get vetted. It would get reviewed by an independent claims adjuster. We'd make sure that it was covered. And assuming it's a valid loss, assuming it was indeed covered, it gets approved. And in that case, your captive would pay 49% or 4.9, I'm sorry, 490,000 of that $1 million loss all of those other 100 captive insurance companies that are participating in the risk distribution arrangement, they would share the remaining $510,000 of your loss in proportion to the premiums that each of them received, right? 
So let's assume that each of them received the same premium to make the math easy. And if there's 100 of them in the pool and their share of the loss is 510,000, what's that mean? That means that each of them has to pony up about 5,100 bucks, um, about a little over 5,000 bucks for their share of my, your, in this example, $1 million loss. Are they excited that they have to pony up 5,100 bucks for their share of your loss? No. But if they have a loss in the future, they're going to get 51% of it paid by the risk distribution pool also. Uh, and if they have claimed tax benefits, the, uh, the $5,100 they had to pay for their share of, of your loss, you know, pales in potentially in comparison to those, uh, those tax benefits. So that's generally the way risk distribution works. Some clients get very concerned, but what if there were just massive claims, right? What if just huge, huge claims? Well, any well-run pool is going to take all the steps that ordinary commercial insurance companies do to prevent that. They're going to underwrite risk. They're going to have premiums that are based on lost histories. They're going to have potentially deductibles and policy limits and everything else. But let's assume just a catastrophic scenario. Let's assume not just one $1 million claim, but let's assume that all 100 captives in our risk pool had a million dollar claim all in the same year against all actuarial odds. They turn out to be perfectly legitimate and valid claims. That's 100 million in claims, right? Well, 49 million of that's gonna be paid by the companies that, um, uh, that are filing the claims. You don't care about that. You only care about the 51 million that's going to be paid by the pool because you're a participant in the pool. Well, what's 51 million divided by 100 captives in the pool? It's $510,000. So in that catastrophic, almost actuary imp actuarially impossible worst case scenario, your captive's maximum exposure is $510,000. That's a lot of money. But if your captive did claim some of the income tax benefits potentially available to it, um, not all that much money, right? Because if we're paying a million dollars of premium to our captive, we might be saving 400,000, 500,000 or more per year in combined federal, state and local taxes, depending on the, uh, the state we may be living in. So even in that situation where the claims were just extraordinarily high, they can pale in comparison to uh, potential tax savings and the other benefits of owning and operating your captive insurance company. That makes sense, Sean. But, you know, I've heard a lot of times captives don't insure real insurable risks. I mean, if, if I get it, if I'm replacing my general liability or my property in a captive, but what if I'm not replacing commercial insurance? How can that be real insurance? Well, this is a great question. And this has fortunately been, you know, one of the areas where the IRS has, um, has tried to litigate uh, a decent amount and lost. So unlike say five, 10, 15 years ago, where this was much more of an open question, we now have um, much clearer guidance than we did back then from the tax courts about what constitutes uh, real insurance arrangements and real risks and, and what does not. So it is true and, and understandably so that you do need to insure real risks that are relevant to your business, right? If you're a construction company and you set up a captive insurance company and you pay premiums to insure your construction company against medical malpractice risk, well, that's just bogus, right? Your, your construction company is not in the business of practicing medicine. It doesn't employ doctors. There is no medical malpractice risk. That would be a bogus sort of fraudulent transaction designed to gin up a tax deduction um, and, and, and not really insure your business for any real risk. So the risk insured do need to be real. They need to be relevant to your business and they need to be actuarially quantifiable. Those are really the three criteria and that's it. It really doesn't matter whether your business has insured those risks before or not. Small and mid-market businesses in particular don't insure many hugely important real and valid risks just because the cost of doing so in a traditional insurance arrangement would be extraordinarily expensive. Um, 
using a captive insurance company to insure those risks, even though they may not have never insured them in the commercial market before because it was too expensive, can make perfect sense. So again, we do have to have real insurable risks. It's now pretty much clearer, at least than it used to be, about what constitutes that. And, uh, and so long as we do that and we have valid and legitimate actuarial pricing, um, you, know, you should have a real legitimate insurance arrangement. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. Well, that's good to know. But, you know, the other thing too, Sean, I mean, captives cost a lot to set up. They cost a lot to operate. I mean, what drives that cost? And, you know, it makes me kind of reluctant. It's a good point because to run a real insurance company in a, in a uh, real and compliant way is not inexpensive. There are, there are uh, attorneys, CPAs, actuaries, uh, risk assessors, claims adjusters, captive managers, um, and potentially other captive insurance related professionals that need to be involved, that need to do quality work, and who are going to typically require that they be compensated for that. So uh, it isn't inexpensive, but in comparison to the benefits received, um, the, the, the cost of setting up and operating the captive insurance company uh, is often rather trivial in the grand scheme of things. A great many, and it depends on the type of captive, it depends on how many risks are insured and the nature of those risks insured, et cetera. But, but you can generally, in the amount of premiums you're paying, but generally you can operate all in cost um, of about, say, 40000 per year to up to maybe 100000 per year. Um, so in that range is the all-in cost, legal fees, accounting fees, jurisdictional fees, actuarial fees, our management fees, everything. And um, again, in comparison to the benefits, if you're paying you know, a million dollars a year a premium to your captive, or you're paying $500,000 a year a premium to your captive, and you're getting critically important insurance that's going to help you survive future situations like the present pandemic or others, um, that cost is a small price to pay. And if you've claimed the federal income tax benefits, that cost will typically be a fraction and usually a small fraction of the tax savings that you realize each year by virtue of owning and operating the captive insurance company. Well, that, sound, that sounds good. I guess it's just a decision of weighing the benefits to the cost. But at the same time, Sean, when I was looking at owning a captive, I understood that the uh, domicile regulator that gave the insurance company its license wanted me to put up a quarter million dollars of initial capital. I mean, that's tying up a lot of capital. Why do I have to do that? And I mean, the other question would be, can I get some of that back eventually? I mean, what's the deal? Great question. So yeah, I mean, if you're forming a real insurance company from scratch and it's going to be, you know, a legitimate company, it needs to have assets. It needs to have reserves to back the risks that it assumes or the actuarial value of the risks that it assumes at least. And so any regulator worth its salt is going to require before they license a captive insurance company that it show that it has a decent amount of capital. That number is often for startup captives around 250,000, but it can vary by domicile and it can vary by the types of policies the captive will issue and, and the amount of risk the captive will assume. Um, so let's go with the $250,000 figure you mentioned. Uh, several different ways to, to potentially meet that capital requirement, right? One is to simply contribute cash or very liquid assets to the captive insurance company when you form it. And if you do that, yeah, that 250,000 is kind of going to be locked up in the captive and, and you won't be able to get it out until sometime down the road when you pay a dividend um, or liquidate the captive insurance company. Um, but you can also generally, in many jurisdictions at least, just post a letter of credit for that 250,000. So you don't actually have to go out of pocket for the 250,000 cash. Maybe you only go, you only put up 50,000 of cash. And then you get a letter of credit for the remaining 200,000 from your bank. Um, and uh, many 
quality jurisdictions will, uh, who license and regulate captive insurance companies will permit that. And, and you'll normally only need that letter of credit to be in force for maybe the first year, first 18 months. Once the captive has gotten its first year behind it, assuming that it hasn't had large claims, it's gonna have a lot of retained earnings. And that retained earnings then gives it the capital that it needs to potentially you know, back the policies that it may issue in year two or in year three. And at that point, um, having that letter of credit may lo no longer be necessary. So the letter can be surrendered and, uh, and you don't have that quarter million dollars of capital you know, tied up in the captive insurance company indefinitely. Got it. Yeah, so I, I definitely feel a lot better knowing I can use a letter of credit for a lot of the capital. But, you know, Sean, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a big deal around here in town, you know, um, and people are always bringing me investment opportunities and stuff because they know I'm a big deal. And so, you know, captives create a lack of access to my money. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, you know, it is important that you treat the captive insurance company as a separate entity with its own profit motive, its own goals and objectives. It can't simply be your personal alter ego or the alter ego of your, your main business. Um, and so when you pay money over to the captive in the form of premiums, the captive needs to invest or to deploy that money in a manner that's consistent with its goals and objectives as an insurance company. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all of that money is tied up forever and that you're losing access to it. Uh, the captive insurance company can eventually make um, investments into non-liquid sort of things. Um, it can invest potentially some of its assets in real estate or limited partnerships or those sort of things. Now, in the first few years, it's going to need to be very liquid uh, until it builds up its balance sheet. But as it builds up its balance sheet, we can, we can seek more return potential in exchange for accepting some illiquidity and those sort of things. So the captive can invest its assets potentially in ways that as a side benefit to benefiting itself might also benefit you as the business owner or might also benefit um, your operating business. It's just essential that that decision be made primarily, though, for the captive's own benefit and based on its goals and objectives. Um, additionally, the captive can eventually pay operating dividends. And uh, you can take profit distributions from the captive in the form of dividends. The captive may be able to do loans to related parties. Now, any such loans, you know, need to be reasonable in amount. They need to bear, you know, arm's length sort of terms in terms of the, uh, the interest rate and that sort of thing. It needs to be a real legit loan, uh, but the captive can loan money um, uh, to, um, to potentially access capital for certain things. And eventually the captive can get years down the road when it's built up its wealth. And uh, if you decide you no longer need the, the money in the captive, or if you just desperately need to uh, access the money in the captive, you can just liquidate it. You can liquidate the captive insurance company, distribute all of its assets out to its owners, at, at which point, um, you know, that money's freely available for other purposes and, um, and potentially start a brand new captive if you still needed insurance for some other reason. So uh, I think it's a bit of a myth that the money is, you know, extremely uh, inaccessible while it's in the captive. It's not, we can do it right, and in a compliant way, in a way that honors the reality of the insurance company as a separate entity, and still um, have access, especially in an urgent sort of, or an emergency sort of situation to the resources of the captive insurance company. Not to mention we can file claims, right? If we have a massive loss um, and that loss is insured, we can always access the money inside the captive by filing claims. All right, that, that sounds good. It's good to know that, um, I guess, once there's sufficient reserves in the captive, uh, I can take a dividend out, it sounds like, or it, the captive could make a loan or it could be an investor. So it sounds like there's some good ways to access the money as long as I can be patient for a couple of years. But, uh, you know, I think that's I, true. I think you should not plan on accessing yeah. the money for the first couple of years. 
Um, yeah. and, and, but once you're past that, assuming you've had a favorable claims history, um, you know, a good portion of that money is going to be available in one form or fashion. Got it. Yeah. The other thing I'm concerned about though, Sean, is, you know, I'm not a huge fan of investing in the, in the stock market, you know, this goes up and down. I feel like it's out of control and I have no idea where it's going to go. And, you know, I understand I can't really invest in illiquid assets. What are alternatives? Well, in the first few years, I think that's true. As your captive is building up its balance sheet, um, you know, it's going to be issuing these policies and it's going to have a limited amount of retained earnings. It's in its first year of existence. It won't have any retained earnings, right? Um, and it's got a limited amount of capital initially backing those policies. And, and if a claim comes in, uh, it's going to need very liquid access to that capital and those premiums in order to pay that claim. So in the early years, yeah, we're going to have to focus on, on high liquidity. Um, but as the captive builds up its balance sheet, we get in year well into year two or year three or beyond, the captive can begin to think more strategically. It can begin to think about how can I increase the rate of return that the captive insurance company earns for its own benefit, just like any other for-profit business would. And if that means investing in things that are less liquid, things like real estate or limited partnerships or LLCs or other business ventures, um, it's generally free to do that. Now, we may need to clear this with the regulators. We need, may need to make sure that we're not using an unacceptably large percentage of the captive's assets in, uh, in illiquid things. Uh, but the longer the captive has been in existence, the, the more and more uh, the, the captive is going to be free to invest in, in potentially illiquid assets over time. Got it. That makes sense. Now, Sean, I was talking to a friend of mine uh, who owns a business as well, and he was telling me really a horror story about his captive. He essentially said that um, he, got, he didn't really like his captive manager after a while and wasn't getting timely response and getting his dividend paid out after he'd owned the captive a few years. Didn't like the, uh, the state where the captive was domiciled, uh, but really couldn't, could, he felt trapped. He was locked in, couldn't change the manager, couldn't change the domicile without having to basically um, open the captive up and have a taxable event. I mean, that, are all captives a trap like that? Yes, well, we've seen this too, unfortunately. Um, and I think part of the misperception here, or part of the myth is that for a few years at least, there were a couple uh, rather large firms in the country who were actively marketing captive insurance companies, but they were marketing a variety, they were just marketing what they described as captive insurance companies. But what they were really marketing was what's called a cell captive or a protected cell captive, or they have different names for it in different states. But essentially, it's, it's not really owning your own captive. It's, it's a rent-a-captive. Um, in this sell captive structure, you're essentially just taking a, um, a division of somebody else's captive insurance company. You're, you don't have your own license that you control. You don't get to decide who manages that captive insurance company or even your division of that captive insurance company. The, the real owner of the, of the mothership uh, captive gets to make those decisions. And that's what happened to the situation you're describing. Someone didn't have a real pure captive. They, they simply rented shelf space in someone else's captive. When you do that, the good news is you can often get the cost down quite a bit. Um, so you can make captives attractive even at lower premium levels. That's the good news. The bad news, though, is that you do give up a lot of the control. You can't hire and fire the captive manager on your own. You can't change the domicile on your own. You can't force the company to pay dividends, you know, whenever you, you, you want or need it and the regulators approve it. So uh, just know that all captives are not alike and in each has its own place and its own role. Um, but for someone like you, Mr. Business Owner, um, my guess is you're going to want to control your own captive insurance company that has its own insurance license where you're the one on the board of directors, you're the one who controls the checking account, uh, et cetera. And, and that's entirely possible to do. That's exactly right. Good deal. All right. 
Well, everybody, this brings us to the end of our webinar today on handling common objections to owning your own insurance company. If you'd like a copy of this webinar, send me an email, either me or Sean, and we'll get a copy to you. Uh, any questions? Feel free to unmute and ask a question or put one in the chat bar if you'd like. I've got a, can you hear me, Randy? This is Chris yeah. Gallo. Hi, Chris. Hi, how are you? Uh, regarding your points that the IRS hating captives and captives don't insure real insurable risks, would not, I mean, due to COVID-19 and the related business interruption, business losses not covered by traditional insurers, would not the IRS's scrutiny be diminished in the low frequency, high severity risks commonly insured in captives? Yeah, great question. Well, that, that's been the IRS's argument. It was an argument they made and tried to make in the RVI tax court case, for example, which was a, a total win for the taxpayer. The, the court uh, really spanked the IRS. The, the court called the, uh, the IRS's uh, legal arguments metaphysical. And when a court calls your legal argument metaphysical, um, that's kind of like the court calling you a dumbass. Um, so, uh, you know the, the the yeah to your to your point any of these risks that captives have or certain varieties of captives have insured business interruption administrative actions risk cyber risk you know the contract cancellation risk supply chain interruption risk the IRS insisted for a long time that these weren't real risks because a business could go six months six years, 60 years, and never have a claim. Well, what the IRS is forgets is that the vast majority of us will die having never filed a claim on our fire insurance policy for our home. Does the fact that we paid fire insurance premiums for 50 years, 60 years before we died and never have a claim mean that fire insurance isn't real? Of course not. And that's exactly what the court in the RBI case held. So I don't know that COVID is going to change the IRS's view. The IRS really is not reasonable and doesn't want or pretend to be reasonable uh, in these matters. But I think it will definitely and absolutely influence the view of judges who are looking at uh, these structures and trying to determine what is real insurance and what's not. And when the IRS comes in and says, well, this isn't real insurance because, um, you know, they've gone 10 years and have never had a claim. Uh, I think we can point to situations like COVID where now we do have lots and lots of claims on these types of policies. Uh, and even if we didn't, uh, we can point to the situation where, you know, COVID was a real risk, even though the United States, you know, hasn't had a situation like this since I think the late 1800s with the Spanish flu. Um, so yes, to your point, the situation with, with COVID and the pandemic and all really has illustrated the supreme importance to small and mid-market businesses of insuring these risks. Captive insurance is the only cost-effective way for a great many of them to do so. And it's really going to undermine, I think, the IRS's attempts to say that these insurance arrangements aren't needed or they're not real or they're, to use the IRS's favorite word, um, ethereal. Yeah, good, great question, and Sean, great answer. We had uh, a question come in on the chat. Uh, this is an objection that we didn't cover today, but Sean, I'm sure you can. I don't know anything about forming a board of directors for my captive. So obviously the captive needs a board. Can you, uh, how, how should a business owner think about that? Sure, well, if you're licensing your, if you're domiciling your captive domestically in a U.S. state, and uh, most people do these days, most small and mid-market businesses at least do. Um, most of those domiciles are gonna require, in fact, that you engage the services of a captive manager, a captive insurance company manager like our firm, CIC Services. There are other firms across the country that, that do the same work too. Um, and that captive insurance company manager um, is going to be somebody that is approved by the domicile to function as a manager of the captive insurance company in that, in that domicile. And they're gonna be familiar with all those little details about how to set up the board of directors and who can be on the board of directors. The regulators are gonna to need to vet the persons who are on the board of directors. So you have to do
do a little biographical affidavit and those sort of things. Uh, but generally, the board can, for, for most purposes, be pretty much anybody the, um, the business owner wants it to be. Uh, you know, if they have a criminal record or, um, you know, some other things that may disqualify them. But, but by and large, the business owner is going to get to choose who they want to be on the board and, and the captive manager will guide them through that, that process. Yeah, very good point. And certainly people that you could put on your board would be your, uh, the business owner, perhaps CFO, perhaps their PNC insurance agent, if they've got trust in them. There's some, some really good people that can think about the business and its uh, success and continuity. Fantastic. Any other questions? All right, very good. Thank you so much for joining us today. Don't be shy. Uh, Sean and I would be happy to talk with you. So you've got our emails here. Reach out to us. We'll schedule time. Uh, if you decide that owning a captive is right for you or you're working with a business owner that would really benefit, we'd be honored to work with you and uh, be your business partner, be their captive manager. I uh, hope everybody has a fantastic rest of the week and don't be shy about reaching out. See you guys.